Good evening and welcome to our uh, Sunday evening uh, worship service here at Oak Ridge. We are glad that you joined us. Uh, I hope you've gotten a chance today to, to enjoy the, the day that we have. God has blessed us with a beautiful season, and I hope you've enjoyed some of that. And Missy, you're probably tired of this, but it's still Misty's birthday, so everybody just remember that. Uh, we're going to start our service this evening uh, with, with the congregational, we, we sing this. You're probably a little more familiar with this one than some others that we have done recently. Uh, but we in, encourage you to come and join us uh, wherever you are. Uh, come thou fount, come thou king. I uh, hope you will join with us and sing as we begin our service.
Tonight we're glad for you to be with us as we get to start a new Bible study. Uh, we will be starting into a series on the book of Nehemiah, and this particular series is called The Wall. And uh, tonight as we get started, we're going to look at some introductory information about this book. Now, you can turn to the book of Nehemiah uh, in your Bible, but tonight specifically we're not going to look at any uh, particular text from the book of Nehemiah. But if you want to open up your Bible, maybe take some notes there as we're, uh, as we're talking, uh, feel free to do that. But it's more or less a time for you to get acquainted with the book of Nehemiah and, and some of the things that we'll be learning about uh, through our study. Uh, of this book. One of the things that I always encourage our folks to do when we do a specific book of the Bible as a study is I encourage them to read a chapter of the book every day uh, as part of their daily Bible reading. And I would encourage you to do that with the book of Nehemiah here, that uh, you would read it um, and read a, a chapter each day and you will become more familiar with uh, these, uh, this story and the, the, the chronology of the story as we go through it uh, each week. Uh, but as you read it, you become more familiar with it. Uh, it'll take you about two weeks to read through. There's 13 chapters. Uh, but over the next several weeks as we do this, I would encourage you to uh, be reading a chapter each day as part of your daily Bible reading. Now, when we study through books of the Bible, uh, we always start off with this introductory lesson, this uh, this uh, this time of learning about and, and really discovering who wrote the book, why they wrote it, when they wrote it, and what was going on uh, in the context of their world at that particular time. And, and most importantly, it's why, why they wrote it. But by starting off with this introduction, we are better able to understand the text that we're going to be studying over the next few weeks. Uh, we'll be able to uh, understand why it says what it says. And so it's important that we have some, uh, some background on it, uh, on this book and any book that we study, so that we can uh, really understand what we're studying and why, we're, uh, why it should impact our faith and our lives. Now, the first thing that we always start off with is uh, talking about the author and the date of writing. And so we would normally look at a book of the Bible uh, named for an individual like Nehemiah. We would look at this and we would naturally assume that the author was the person who uh, the book was named for. Uh, and if you uh, were to make that assumption, most times you're going to be right in the, uh, in the course of the biblical text. Uh, you'll a lot of times find that to be the case. But if you make that assumption about the book of Nehemiah, you're actually only about half right. And the reason for that is the material for the book of Nehemiah comes from Nehemiah's own personal memoirs, from his own diary, if you want to look at it, his own journal, if you look at it from that perspective. Uh, Nehemiah uh, did provide the, the source material in that regard, so you are half right if you said Nehemiah was the author. But what we do know is that the one who is believed to have written the memoirs in the, in the style and in the way that we have it in the biblical text, that would be uh, the scribe Ezra. The same individual we know to have written the book of Ezra. And, uh, you know, until about five or six hundred years ago, the Jewish uh, Bible, the Hebrew Bible, was actually uh, containing uh, Ezra and Nehemiah in one single book until maybe five or six hundred years ago. And since then, they have been split. And if you look at the book, at the end of the writing of Ezra, it sort of has this rather abrupt ending. And what that uh, is from is the fact that Ezra and Nehemiah used to be uh, joined together. And uh, that's because Jewish tradition places Ezra as the writer of not only Ezra and Nehemiah, but also the, book, the books of Chronicles. And if you look in your Bible, it comes First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. So that whole section is attributed to the scribe Ezra uh, as the writer. Now, a person of Ezra's status among not only the Jewish people, uh, as well as his position in the Persian government, this would have given him great access to all of the information that we see recorded in the, both the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And his access to the royal archives of the Persian Empire and to Nehemiah's personal memoirs, uh, when we look at that, that gave him great material for him to really record what God was doing in a powerful way as he led the Jews home from 
from exile back to Jerusalem. And so he had great source material uh, to write with, uh, and you know we see that he did a great job of sharing with us uh, the heart of what God was doing in this uh, important time in Jewish history. Now, when it comes to the dating of the writing of the book and the events of the book, we see that those are really from two different time periods. Uh, not much different, but they are from two different times. And the dates of the events, you know, the, the dates of the actual occurrences of what happens, we'll look at in just a few moments. Uh, and those are not disputed. Because of internal references, we know when those events occurred. But the date of the writing is believed to have been towards the end of, of Nehemiah's second term as governor in Jerusalem. He served twice as the governor in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, and this was believed to have been written towards the end of his second term. And this would have been most likely uh, sometime around 424 B.C. to 400 B.C., we know that it wasn't written any later than 400 BC, but we're not exactly sure. So there's a you know probably a 20 year time span there that Nehemiah, could, the book of Nehemiah, could have been written. And so we're not really sure when his second term as governor ended, uh, but we do know that uh, the book would have been written either shortly before or right after the end of his term, uh, second term as governor. And so now that we know who wrote the book and, and roughly when it was written, uh, that can help us to start to frame a little bit more about the background and the setting. And that's what we're going to look at next as far as the book of Nehemiah goes because the background and the setting of this book is right after some of the darkest days in the history of the Jewish people. You know, the Jewish nation had faced some really dark days before the writing of Nehemiah or the events of Nehemiah. And to really set the stage for what we see in the book of Nehemiah, we have to go back more than 300 years before the events of Nehemiah's uh, book and, and really get an idea of what's going on here. And so we're going to look through the, we're going to hit the highlights really quickly of some of the events that sort of lead or pave the way for the events that we see happening in uh, the days of Nehemiah. Now, after uh, Israel split, uh, they split into these two kingdoms after uh, Solomon uh, died. Uh, after King David and King Solomon, we see that uh, Solomon's uh, kids eventually uh, uh, lose the kingdom or it splits. And you have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, during this time, we see that they split. And both kingdoms start a downward spir spiral spiritually. Uh, and they, they just, they just nosedive spiritually uh, to the point where they're involved in idol worship and, and other things. But what we see as a result of this is God's punishment on, uh, on both kingdoms, and that is in his punishment is in the form of exile. And so what we know is from, from not only biblical history but from world history that in 772 B.C. the Assyrian army comes in and they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and took them into exile. And what they did was they dispersed them throughout the known world. Uh, so they, you know, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, all of a sudden, they are dispersed throughout uh, the, uh, the known world. And so if we fast forward uh, almost 200 years to si the time period between 605 B.C. and 586 B.C., we know that this is uh, really a 20-year campaign by the Babylonians to not only conquer, uh, is or conquer Jerusalem, and Judah, but what they end up doing is they take captives every time they attacked over this time period back to Babylon. And not only that, eventually they come in in 586 B.C. and they destroy the city of Jerusalem. They not only uh, destroy the, the temple and the entire city of Jerusalem, but what is important for our understanding of the book of Nehemiah, they destroyed the walls, the wall surrounding the city of Jerusalem. 
And so uh, after this, we have to fast forward another 50 years, and we come to the time when now the Persian Empire is in control of the, the Middle East, and they are in control, and there is a king by the name of King Cyrus who gives a decree that uh, the temple in uh, Jerusalem is to be rebuilt, and, and they're going to help provide the funds and do all the, uh, the things that are necessary to help uh, the Jews start to relocate to uh, to Jerusalem. And so as they're relocating and rebuilding the, the temple, uh, King Cyrus agrees for uh, the Persians to help uh, accomplish this. And this is what we read in Ezra 1, uh, chapter 1 through uh, chapter 6. And so we see that this is uh, creeping up on the time of Nehemiah here. And so uh, we see that this was what happened there. But what we understand is that the because of this beginning of, uh, to, of a relocation from Persia to Jerusalem by the Jews, we see that this, uh, this uh, relocation or return took place in three phases. There were three phases or three times where they were making major uh, relocations. And the first one uh, was when King Cyrus originally uh, made uh, the declaration for the, the temple to be rebuilt. Uh, there around the time period of uh, 586 or I mean, I'm sorry 539 BC what we see is that Zerubbabel and the, uh, the priest Joshua they lead the reconstruction efforts of the temple and as they do they go and they rebuild the temple and they start to repopulate Jerusalem at the at the decree of si King Cyrus and then about 80 years later uh, with the temple completed but the wall around Jerusalem still destroyed. What we see is that Ezra leads a group of exiles back from, uh, from Persia to Jerusalem. And that's what we read about in the book of Ezra between chapter 7 and chapter 10. We see, a, we see the return of, of more Jews to Jerusalem. And then 13 years after Ezra leads his group, we see that Nehemiah leads another group back to Jerusalem. But their primary goal in returning to Jerusalem was to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And that's what we'll hear about a lot as we are uh, studying through the book of Nehemiah. Now, to help us further set the stage for uh, us as we consider the circumstances surrounding Nehemiah's uh, return to Jerusalem to build that wall, we see that there are certain things that uh, can help set the stage for us in understanding what's happening in the events of Nehemiah's day. You know, one of the things is that, that we can see is that God was able to use the events of another book in the Bible to help really set the stage for Nehemiah to have this highly regarded position uh, in, the, in the court of the Persian king and for him to be in a place of influence with the king. See, King Artaxerxes, who is the king in Nehemiah's day, had a stepmother by the name of Queen Esther. And so Esther, who uh, saved the Jews from uh, Haman's attempt to uh, destroy them, uh, Queen Esther would have still had a, a great level of influence as the stepmother to the current king. And so she would have been able to not only uh, help Nehemiah be in a position of influence with the king, but that helped with the rebuilding of the wall as well. And so we can be certain that her lasting influence on the Persian court would have been used by God to help uh, bring the favor of the Jews, uh, with, bring them favor uh, with the Persians. Now, uh, something else that helps to set the stage for us is that oftentimes when people read these biblical accounts of things that happened in the Bible, a lot of times people will look at it and say, oh, well, that's just a, a, a feel-good story or that it is... Uh, maybe a, a legend or a myth or something along those lines. And so uh, when we look at those things, uh, people look at those stories and th say, hey, they're just made up by man. That's all they, uh, all they really are. But God used the historical records of other nations surrounding the Persian Empire uh, to help prove the facts, that, uh, the fact of what we read in biblical stories. Uh, as specifically here with the book of Nehemiah, we see it with other uh, biblical uh, stories and things that are shared there. Uh, but there is a collection of documents called the Elephantine Papyri that are uh, Egyptian documents that record certain events from the time frame of 
uh, of the life of Nehemiah. It's the same time frame uh, in the er, you know in the uh, the time period of you know probably 440 uh, 450 BC to 400 BC. And these papyri they uh, they have a collection that uh, that share these events and reference people from the book of Nehemiah actually, which is kind of uh, kind of crazy that we would think that these things have survived. They were found a little over 100 years ago for the most part. Uh, and they uh, they share uh, about events uh, that that happened in uh, people. One of the things that it shares about is it mentions the the name of Sanballat, who was the uh, Persian governor in Samaria. And Sanballat is the person that we r- will read about in the book of Nehemiah, who causes so much grief and so many problems for Nehemiah. He's sort of the antagonist in the story, but these Egyptian documents from the same time period reference him as the Sumerian governor at that time. Not only that, we see also that there is a, name, a man by the name of Bigvi, uh, Bigve, I'm sorry, and his, uh, he is mentioned in both Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, but the interesting thing is these uh, Egyptian documents reference him as the governor after Nehemiah's second term as governor. So he is the one who would take over as the uh, Persian governor after uh, after Nehemiah steps down uh, at his second term. And so it's interesting that we see that uh, from, this, uh, from this regard, but we have those extra-biblical historical records that help us to, to see a, a different view of what we read about in the book of Nehemiah. But there's one final thing to share with you about setting the stage uh, in the book of Nehemiah, and that is the timing of the events and the writing uh, of this book. Now, I want you to understand that we're not studying the book of Malachi right now, but the book of Nehemiah and the book of Malachi were both written just a a little before 400 B.C., and so they were both they were they were contemporaries of each other. They were both written about the same time, and uh, what we understand this to be mean for us is that these two books, the book of Malachi and Nehemiah, are the last two books to be written chronologically in the Old Testament. Even though Nehemiah is back in a, an earlier section, and Malachi is the last book of the of the Old Testament, what we understand is that that they were written at the same time, just a little more than four hundred years before Christ uh, uh, was born. Now, after after Nehemiah and Malachi were written, what we see is that God went silent for four hundred years and did not speak through the prophets for four hundred years. And that was uh, a powerful thing for, for God not to be speaking through the prophets. And he didn't start speaking again through the prophets until the days of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And so what we see is that, that at that time, God started to speak again, and he started to share uh, about the uh, coming of the Messiah and, and all of this. But what we, what we should pay particular attention to about the chronology or the timing of the writing of the book of Nehemiah and Malachi uh, is this, that it was, uh, you know, we see that he, he, God was sharing these messages and then he went silent, so to speak, that he didn't share anymore. But what that means for us is that once God chose to be silent, we should pay really close attention to the last things he had to say. You know, a lot of times we think about people sharing their final words of wisdom, you know, or maybe the last word somebody ever speaks or something like that. And we think about the weight with which we listen to those words. Well, the words, the final words of God in the book of Nehemiah and Malachi are very heavy for us when we think about the fact that God did not speak to the nation of of Judah or Israel for another 400 years. And so this is going to be some powerful words that we're going to read as we uh, prepare uh, as we study the, prepare to study the words uh, in Nehemiah. Now, something else that we want to pay attention to as we study the book of Nehemiah is the theological themes that we see throughout the book. And there are several of them uh, that permeate through the book of Nehemiah, but we're going to look at, we're going to mention just four of them. And these are things that we can start to watch for as we begin studying the book of Nehemiah. And as we go through each chapter, we can look for these sort of Things. One of those key themes uh, would be uh, spiritual leadership. Uh, we see in the book of, of Nehemiah a great, 
um, uh, a, a great story on leadership. Now, you could take the events of the book of Nehemiah and you could write a great self-help book on how to be a leader in business and, and leader in the world and, and, and all of those things just from the story of, of Nehemiah. But what we see is more impactful and more important is how his leadership example can help us in being a leader not only in the church, a spiritual leader not only in the church, but also in uh, our homes, in our workplaces, in our community. And so what we'll see through the book of Nehemiah is how we can be spiritual leaders even in uh, our homes and going out from there. Another key thing that we will see uh, in Nehemiah is opposition. You know, uh, throughout the story of Nehemiah, we will see opposition after opposition after opposition. And we will see this over and over and over. Uh, and this opposition is in regards to the work that God has placed on Nehemiah's heart, the work that God has specifically designed him to accomplish. And uh, this opposition just continues. And the opposition, opposition will at times be minor, and then other times it has the chance to derail everything. And so we see that there is this, you know, this wide range of opposition that will be faced uh, throughout this story. But we will see how, uh, in our modern context, how we can face opposition to the plans that God has for our lives and how we can continue to move forward to accomplish what God has designed us to accomplish and those plans that he has laid on our heart. You know, another key theme that we will see in this book is spiritual revival. Uh, you know, we'll see how the spiritual groundwork uh, laid by Ezra years ahead of the time of Nehemiah uh, will pay big dividends in Nehemiah's story and in his time as there is a spiritual revival amongst the Jews in Jerusalem. And so we'll see that this uh, will happen. What we can see uh, for ourselves is how the fruits of our labor can bring about a spiritual revival in the lives of those uh, that we are, are faithful uh, to minister to. And, and when we are faithful to do what is necessary to do the uh, groundwork, like, lay the groundwork like Ezra did, we'll get to see the fruits of that uh, labor uh, a lot of times as well. Now, one final theme that we see in Nehemiah is obedience. And, you know, Nehemiah was obedient to God in some very powerful ways. And it, it's remarkable when we watch uh, how he was obedient. But through his obedience to God, Nehemiah was able to accomplish uh, a God-sized task of rebuilding the walls surrounding Jerusalem in only 52 days. That's less than two months. 52 days, they're able to rebuild the wall and accomplish this God-sized task that just was mind-blowing, I'm sure, to the people who were participating, but also to the enemies who were looking for opportunities and times to uh, attack uh, the Jews in Jerusalem. And so what we will see is how God can do extraordinary things through us when we are obedient to what he says for us to do and for what he uh, has for us to do. And so when we're obedient to him, God will work in ways that will just leave us in awe. You know, uh, each week as we go through the book of Nehemiah, we will look uh, uh, through a chapter in the book each week. And we'll, just, we'll continue making our way through that. But one of the things that we will notice is that uh, Ezra regularly uses this term, the hand of the Lord. And what he's doing is he's describing God's sovereign influence in Nehemiah's life and the situation surrounding him. <coughs> Excuse me. But as we look at, at this interaction by the hand of God in the life of Nehemiah week after week, we're going to also look at uh, the moments in those stories where we see the hand of the Lord moving and then see how we can watch for the hand of the Lord to be moving in our own lives uh, 2,400 years later. And so uh, each week we'll, we'll finish out our Bible study uh, each night uh, just as an opportunity to watch how the, the hand of the Lord has been active 
in uh, in our situations and in our lives, and uh, and and use that to not only strengthen our faith but also to uh, to help us be able to um, to look for His hand working in in other ways. And so tonight, for us to close out our Bible study, I'm going to share one of those moments with you uh, from my own personal history here lately of, of watching the Lord work. Uh, and just sort of give you a taste of, of how we can watch for the hand of the Lord working in, in our situations. You know, um, as, as most of you know, uh, a little, almost a month ago, my wife Misty uh, suffered a heart attack, and she was uh, placed into the hospital. And um, at, just to be very honest with you, at one point we were, you know, I was told uh, that they weren't sure that she was even going to survive. And that was a very um, scary but humbling experience in that moment to realize uh, just how close uh, she had come in that moment to uh, not being here today. But one of the things that, um, that I was told through this process was that um, I wouldn't even be able to go into the hospital. And uh, that's a scary thought when uh, your wife or a loved one is in the hospital during this time and unable to, you're unable to be there uh, to watch over them, to support them, to care for them, and do the things that are necessary there. Uh, but originally, I was told I wouldn't even be able to be in the hospital. Uh, eventually, what would, I would be told was, well, you can come in the hospital, but you're going to have to wait in the waiting room, and you're not going to get to interact with your wife. Uh, I did have a couple of opportunities, though, because of the hand of the Lord, uh, to be able to interact with her for just a, a moment or two uh, while she was uh, going between treatments and unconscious. Uh, but I was able to interact with her for just a moment, and I was told uh, after that, well, you're not going to be able to stay in the hospital. And then I was told, well, you'll be able to stay in the hospital, but you have to stay in the ICU waiting room, and you won't be able to go and see her. Uh, and eventually I was told, well, you're not, you can stay in the ICU waiting room, but then you can come see her for just a few minutes, but you can't stay back there. Eventually, because of the hand of the Lord and not for any other reason, I was able to be able to stay with my wife uh, during the day, uh, except for when ICU was shut down uh, for visit, from visitation and things. I was able to stay with my wife uh, for an extended period of time because she was uh, in such a critical state, um, I was able to stay with her. And I, I, I don't give credit on that to anyone other than the Lord because of knowing the, the circumstances surrounding the current pandemic and uh, the availability of being able to visit in the hospital. Uh, that's just one of many ways that I have seen in, through our situation in recent, uh, in recent weeks that the Lord has had his hand on this situation to provide me the opportunity just to be there to be able to care for her and be able to uh, help her through this process. And so eventually, uh, once she was no longer critical, I wasn't able to stay with her. But from the very beginning, my hope was that I would have to leave the hospital because she was uh, well enough to, uh, for me not to be able to be there. And eventually that was the case. But I did see the, 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 hands, the hand of the Lord through this situation uh, uh, in many ways. But that's just one that uh, as we examine those situations in our life, we can look for how the Lord is working and how he is sovereign in every situation. And so with that being shared, I'm going to uh, end our uh, Bible study tonight on uh, the study of Nehemiah. Uh, next time that we have our Sunday evening service will be in two weeks because next Sunday is uh, Mother's Day. We won't have a Sunday evening worship service, uh, but the week after Mother's Day, we will have uh, our first study uh, in uh, chapter one of Nehemiah. And so we want to encourage you to be here with us uh, for that particular study uh, here in two weeks. Also, we want to uh, remind you that on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we will have our, uh, our Wednesday night topic study where we are studying uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, how when we become believers in Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And we're going to learn uh, some things about the Holy Spirit through this study. And so I hope that you would be with us uh, for that study here, in, uh, here on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, next Sunday morning, as I said, is Mother's Day, and so we're looking for, uh, forward to a great time of celebrating our mothers and, uh, and uh, remembering our mothers that may have already passed on. Uh, but as we do, uh, do look to celebrate them, we will have uh, a special message uh, tailored specifically for our mothers, and so I want to encourage you to be here next Sunday morning. Uh, at 10.30 on our YouTube channel to, uh, to, and Facebook to be a part of that worship service with us. And so with those things being shared, I'm going to close us with a word of prayer, and we'll be finished for the evening.
Father, we do thank you uh, for what you have shown us through the book of Nehemiah. And Father, I pray that as we go forward from here that we would, uh, that we would look for your hand uh, to be sovereign in every aspect, in every situation in our life. And so, Father, I pray that we would be faithful, that when we see that, that we would give you glory, that we would give you praise for what you have done in those situations. But, Father, I pray that we would learn uh, the very valuable lessons that are shared in the book of Nehemiah and that we would uh, just look forward to, to how you are going to share with us uh, through that word. And so, Father, I pray that we would trust you uh, for what you have uh, for us through the book of Nehemiah and that we would take it to heart. And we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.